Ambassador Jack Madlock. Thank you very much for coming to the Krasno event series here at UNC in Chapel Hill. Thank you for the invitation. You are very welcome. You were American ambassador to the Soviet Union between 1987 and 1991. You have a great expertise in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And I would just like to ask you some questions about the current situation uh, regarding American-Russian relations. Almost on a daily basis, we read about Russian meddling in the American election campaign, both in the past and in the forthcoming one. Can we take that really seriously? Is there an awful lot of Russian meddling going on, and has it harmful consequences? I think that we've blown that out of all proportion. Uh, the fact is that uh, Americans elected Donald Trump president under American law created by Americans. And uh, I think uh, the attempt to find a Russian role uh, has, been, uh, has been distracting. Thank you. Um, when we look at Syria and the Middle East, Russia has been involved in the Syrian civil war for a couple of years now. What do the Russians do there? Do they need to be there? And is there the danger of a serious American-Russian military clash? So could it escalate into a major war between these two countries? I don't think it will escalate. I think that actually our, our um, uh, forces on the ground are communicating, and most of the time communicate. Now, there have been incidents where uh, Americans uh, we said later by mistake, had hit some uh, Syrian government forces uh, with Russians there. And there's been a report fairly recently uh, that uh, an attack, at least by uh, those Syrians that we back, uh, killed a number of Russians. Uh, and apparently not regular service people, but contract uh, contractors. I believe that both sides will uh, avoid all uh, the uh, any uh, escalation of a contract between us. I think one has to ask why did uh, uh, Russia come in? And I think they saw that uh, if Assad's forces collapsed, that Syria would, uh, would sort of turn into a new Libya or uh, it, it would become essentially ungovernable except by ISIS. Uh, and uh, since they are very vulnerable to the jihadists, uh, they felt they had a, uh, a, a, an interest along with Iran, uh, which of course is backing Assad, uh, and the uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, to try to stabilize the situation. I, I believe that uh, Russia would like uh, to see a settlement uh, that ends the war, and they don't care that much, I think, whether Assad stays or not. I don't think their stakes are on Assad. I think they do want to avoid uh, chaos and anarchy, uh, which is favorable to uh, the jihadists. And I think that's been their main motivation. Uh, their secondary motivation is not to let the U.S. be the arbiter of all of these things, but take other people's interest into account. But probably more important than either of us are the other people involved. The Saudis, the Turks, uh, the Iranians, uh, the, you know, some of the Gulf uh, states. Uh, and uh, the fact is that it's a very, very messy situation. And I think that the initial American policy of, of basing everything on removing Assad was probably short-sighted. Uh, I, I don't like his rule any better than anybody else. But on the other hand, if the, if the, if the uh, uh, alternative is anarchy, then uh, it's a Hobbesian world, or else at least uh, some, uh, some order. And we should remember that, in general, Assad has protected the minorities. Uh, the Christians and uh, the other non-Muslim minorities, and and uh, this is the Muslim, you know, non-Sunni sects, so that uh, although the Sunnis are in a majority, uh, the, the fact is that Syria has probably done a better job than some of the others of actually protecting the minorities. Thank you. Uh, Russia is, of course, a very large country. It still is a formidable nuclear power. 
But otherwise, when we look at the Russian economy, it is in dire straits. The infrastructure, the dem demography of the country, general health uh, is declining. So I wonder, is Russia really as strong as we may think at first sight, or is Putin really overplaying his hand? So is Russia not really a great power anymore except the nuclear dimension? Uh, and is he trying to play way above uh, his weight? Well, you know, I think that Russia is certainly a power in its region. And I think also one of the messages they were trying to send and whatever they did regarding the election is that they have cyber capability. And I think that what has been most damaging to the relationship has been the psychological put-downs. You don't count anymore, in effect, seem to be the attitude. And uh, often what they've been doing is start taking us seriously, damn it. And uh, I think that's part of it. And, uh, but um, actually, uh, the things can be exaggerated. The, the economy, at least in Moscow and St. Petersburg, is not all that bad. We were in St. Petersburg for a week. Uh, and certainly in St. Petersburg, there's no shortage of food. Uh, you don't get a lot of imported from the West because of their counter sanctions, but it's perfectly adequate. Uh, in, in Russia's vacation and so on, and uh, they still travel abroad uh, freely, uh, and uh, uh, there is great income disparity, but there is definitely a middle class, definitely a professional class. Uh, the uh, life expectancy and, in general, uh, medical treatment is improving. Uh, it had gotten, it had reached uh, real depths in the 90s. Uh, it, uh, male life expectancy, I think, is five or six years older than it was then. It was invisible then, of course. But uh, it, gradually, those are, uh, uh, now mortality is still exceeding the uh, uh, births. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> with a world that is going to be increasingly prob uh, problematic with overpopulation, I don't know why necessarily big populations are going to be the measure of strength. Uh, I, one of our sons uh, uh, lives in Moscow, and uh, our daughter-in-law is Russian. Uh, her mother uh, recently uh, had uh, uh, a treatment for her cancer. It was treatment that if she had gone to Finland would have cost, I think, something like $60,000. She got it free and very efficiently in the Russian system. So, um, you know, you, uh, when you begin to look at the particulars, uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, imported 20 to 30 million tons of grain a year. Russia is now an exporter, even though it has <laughs> lost the biggest grain producing areas in, in, in Ukraine. So, you know, and, and uh, I'm told by those who, for example, uh, uh, look at construction, that right now construction in Moscow is almost 100% Russian financed, Russian sourced, uh, Russian built, uh, except, uh, I guess, for some of the casual labor, they use uh, 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 immigrants uh, from Central Asia. But uh, the, the thing is, the, uh, I don't think the, uh, the economy is flat on its back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Russian-Chinese relations have recently greatly improved. Is that a, an alliance, a friendship which is going to last, or is that really an unholy alliance which only gets together because of animosity uh, with the West and toward the West? Well, to the degree it becomes an alliance against something, it's probably not going to work. To the degree it, it is an alliance that actually produces uh, results, then I, I think that's good for everybody. I mean, why would we want enmity between them? Uh, the, it, the new Silk Road uh, that is being built, uh, the Chinese are putting enormous uh, capital into it. Whether it will actually work eventually, well, we'll see. Uh, maybe it won't. On the other hand, uh, you know, with more efficient uh, and uh, better service along the uh, Trans-Siberian, uh, you can cut the time in moving 
uh, goods to Western Europe about in half as compared with moving them by sea. And there are certain types of goods that that's going to be, uh, that's going to make you know, it worthwhile to uh, price it. Uh, but then there's also the question of development along the corridor. So I think the Chinese are putting a lot into that. And uh, uh, it may turn out to be a huge boondoggle, but it may turn out uh, to be a great asset to the areas in between. And Russia wouldn't mind an increase of uh, Chinese geopolitical influence in the Caucasus? Uh, you know, uh, if it's a matter of Chinese, uh, uh, I, could, I could easily see Russia uh, cooperating with China to uh, develop a, uh, an, I would say, an international financial system that would compete with the dollar or be an alternative to the dollar. And I, I see a number of signs that that could be feasible in the next 10, 15 years. Uh, and I'm not sure that would be bad for the world. You know, I think monopolies are bad for everybody, including the monopolist in the long run. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need a world system that uh, would have more than the dollar to base its value on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, in your talk here, you said that what Putin above all wants is respect. And is that really Putin's overall political objective, to obtain respect for himself and for his country, or has he other objectives in your mind, you know, like expansionist objectives? When we think of Crimea and Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, yeah. we may think he may, or there's a fear about the Baltic uh, uh, countries, will he uh, be likely to I don't, expand I don't, to them? I cannot imagine there would be a military attack on the Baltics. What in the world would they gain from that? I, I think that's an utter fantasy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can imagine uh, the Balts are nervous, just as, uh, I mean, uh, given their history and so on, but the fact is, this isn't the Soviet Union. And they don't claim the Baltics. Uh, now, when you really look at the history of some of the other things, it's much more complicated than a very simplistic view. You take the status of Crimea. It had never been in Ukraine until Khrushchev uh, in the 1950s just administratively transferred everything but the city of Sevastopol and the naval base to Ukraine. Now, this is when all of Ukraine was run from Moscow, so it didn't really make any difference. Uh, but the population remained, uh, I think, over two-thirds Russian. Uh, very, in fact, there were very few Ukrainians. There were Crimean Tatars, many other nationalities there, Greeks, uh, and so on. But uh, basically, it had been largely populated uh, by Russians and Crimean Tatars uh, uh, before. Uh, and the thing is, we are supposed to believe in self-determination, but when the Soviet Union broke up, there was never a vote by the people in Crimea as to whether they wanted to be in Russia or Ukraine. There was a vote as to whether Ukraine should break away from the Soviet Union. Uh, and there was a slightly over 50% vote in favor of that. But the fact is that uh, uh, what Putin feared uh, was uh, that if uh, the government of Ukraine which came into power by a coup d'etat. It was not a true revolution. It was basically a coup d'etat, uh, which we were very much involved in, including the fact of actually naming the prime minister. You're speaking of, of uh, involvement in elections. In this case, we were, in, we were deeply involved in removing a, a person who had been elected. He was very corrupt, but he had been elected. Uh, and uh, so, um, the, uh, the, the, this was obviously something that was going to be very much a red line uh, with Putin because he could visualize losing that naval base, which is probably the, one of the most important in all of Russian history. Uh, and furthermore, uh, he would have on his argument the fact that the most of the uh, people in Crimea almost certainly did want to be, prefer to be in Russia. I would add 
that in the Soviet Union, Crimea had an autonomous status. One of the things we never faced legally at the end of the Cold War, it was the obligation of these new states to respect autonomies. Every one of these regional conflicts arose out of the abolition of autonomous status before. So when we're talking about legality, we also have to think of what people think, not only of legality, but also of justice. And, and often the formal legality and a sense of justice conflict. So that's why I think it is wrong to look at these things uh, as just black and white. Uh, and particularly if we want to avoid or minimize violence, it's much better if we stay out of uh, these essentially family disputes. Thank you. Let me ask you one final question. If you were advising the Trump administration, what would you recommend the president and his administration what to do about how to improve Russian-American relations? Well, I, I can't imagine that I would uh, either be invited uh, to be in the Trump administration or that I would agree if I were. I think we have put ourselves in a position, particularly our Congress, that right now it is virtually impossible to do what we desperately need to do, and that is improve relations with Russia. And I, I, uh, the, 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 although this whole matter of Russian interference, I think, is, is largely uh, a red herring, uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, the president is so unpopular with so many of our people that I don't believe he has the capacity to lead us to what I believe he wants to do, which is to improve relations. But there will always be those who say, oh, they have something on him. You know, maybe they do. But shouldn't the question be, does what he wants to be, do in our interest or not? If it's in our interest, I'd say that's what we ought to do because it's in our interest. But right now, our political system seems to be incapable of thinking that way. Right, but how would you, you know, let's take that away, but how would it be possible to improve relations? By having a meeting? Well, having uh, you know, I, I think with prior agreement, and uh, that you'd have to do quietly, uh, both of our leaders uh, should be able to make a speech uh, and make the point that uh, it is dangerous for our countries to have bad relations because we need each other for the most serious problems facing us. Uh, and that the differences we have are not of that magnitude. Uh, and that therefore we must find a way uh, to cooperate on other issues and essentially to agree to disagree on those of lesser importance uh, that uh, thing. Uh, and uh, then it seems to me uh, to start with a trade-off of dropping the sanctions in return for a return to full cooperation on nuclear safety issues would be a very favorable agreement to the United States. Now, to recommend that when you know very well Congress would not let him do it would probably be irresponsible. So uh, that's what it is not. Uh, I say right now, uh, our politics have created an atmosphere that make it practically impossible to do the rational thing with the relationship. And that's what worries me. I, you know, somehow some of this is going to have to blow over. And we're probably going to need, uh, I would say, a true conservative, uh, uh, not someone who's flaky and radical, like our current president, uh, to mend things. I, I do believe that with the right president and the right policies, uh, we could begin to cooperate on many areas with a Russia, even if it continues to rule by, by, rule by Putin. And I think if we were cooperating, he would probably have less excuse for and less need for some of his repressive measures. Thanks. That's the other feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insights. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>